Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier, and thanks again for stopping by. I do appreciate the fact that people take time out of their busy day to listen to my musings. Um, I do have to go to the optician this, this afternoon, and she said to me, Ali Khan, why don't you try um, having the surgery? And I said, you know, I will when I can find a single optician who has had that surgery. If you haven't had a chance to look at Charles Ireland's MindSpeak session, please do. That link is on the front of the website and on Rich Wrap Ups. Um, I am looking forward to being in London this weekend for the Homecoming Revolution event. Uh, that's on the Saturday the 15th, Sunday the 16th of March at Olympia. Um, Angel Jones, who can be found on Twitter as at Angel One Jones, uh, one of the founders of Homecoming Revolution, came one day and found me in this very office. And her tagline on Twitter is irresistible. It says, ex advertising chick, a yippie, which turns out to be a yuppie plus a hippie. Um, lots of uh, folks flying in this weekend for it. Um, and uh, it's, it looks like looking for African professionals across all sectors financial services, management, strategic consulting, FMCG, ITC, engineering and construction, healthcare, education, sales, and marketing what makes the homecoming revolution platform unique continues jones is that employers are engaging candidates in an inspirational environment that includes motivating case studies top speakers workshops relocation services immigration advice property and schools as well um, jones claims the decision to return home is an emotional one We've found that successful returnees move home firstly to be closer to friends and family, second for a sense of belonging and purpose, and only third for career. So if you, off, if you find yourself haggling over your pay package as the deciding factor on it, on if you'll move home or not, then you simply aren't ready to return and you should stay where you are. Um, on that note, I'm going to move to home thoughts and just mention it was a pleasure catching up with my good friend Alex uh, Michaelis, who's the architect for a fantastic house up uh, in Lewa. Um, and on that note, I'll put up three photographs of Nairobi. The first was taken at 9.18 a.m. on Saturday uh, this weekend, and I saw this fire, and it turned out to be a restaurant that had caught fire. Um, another photograph I took 47 days ago when I was reading Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon, who talks about a screaming coming across the sky. And uh, in this photograph, it looked as if there was a screaming coming across the sky. This is the most important African business center between the Mediterranean and Johannesburg, states Anthony Havelock of Knight Frank. And finally, <coughs> I'll put up a photograph taken from CNBC, which is in the CBD, looking up towards Westgate, the day it caught fire. I finished reading Thomas Pynchon's extraordinary inherent vice. I think both Pynchon and Delilo are these very luminous and illuminating writers of the contemporary state of affairs. Uh, this is from Inherent Vice. Real estate water rights, oil, cheap labor, all of that's ours. It's always been ours. And you, at the end of the day, what are you? One more unit in this swarm of transients who come and go without pause here in the sunny Southland, eager to be bought off with a car of a certain make, model and year, a blonde in a bikini, 30 seconds on some excuse for a wave, a chilly dog for Christ's sake, he shrugged. We will never run out of you people. The supply is inexhaustible. Inaugs, <laughs> um, I'll leave that. Um, if you have a chance, have a look at this photograph I found uh, of New York on Time magazine. It's, you've got to click on the link because it really is amazing. Political Reflections, uh, Tristan McConnell tweeted, uh, retweeted um, Kim and his groupies. And you can see in this photograph, uh, Kim, and, um, uh, Kim uh, of North Korea, quite an extraordinary photograph, coming to uh, Crimea, Ukraine. Tens of thousands of people thronged Red Square, chanting, Crimea is Russia. 
Ukraine can be classified as a geopolitical pivot, that is a state whose importance is derived not from their power and motivation, but rather from their sensitive location and from the consequences of their potentially vulnerable condition for the behavior of geopolitical players. For Brzezinski, who is an eminence grease in these matters and an advisor to the president, a Ukraine severed from Russia consequently severs Russia from Europe albeit in his terms in its imperial status as a Eurasian power. Severed from Ukraine, Russia would be reoriented towards Asia, which sets it on a collision course with an emerging China, an ideal scenario for Washington. At the heart of the crisis lies a Western ambition for the expansion of their strategic bridgehead into the Eurasian supercontinent, this time very soft underbelly of Russia. This attitude for Washington's recent wave of regime change was recently summed up by Ben Rhodes, Deputy National Security Advisor for the Obama regime, and infinitely more powerful than that name might suggest. Uh, these democratic movements would be more sustainable if they are seen as not an extension of America or any other country, but coming from within these societies. For the longer term, it is better to let the people within the country be the strongest voice, whilst also ensuring that the, at the appropriate times you are weighing in publicly and privately, driving from behind. I put up a photograph of President uh, Putin and just comment that he's been winning for a while. Now, David Remnick, um, I, I disagree with in his latest uh, iterations, he says that Putin's dreams of staying in office until 2024 of being the most formidable state builder in Russian history since Peter the Great, and yet founder on the peninsula of Crimea. I don't think so. He's got a majority of his people in place there, um, and it is a key. It's, it would be simply unconscionable for him to lose it. Power delusions, US-Russia face-off over Ukraine, and I agree with this. They see it as an erosion of their buffer zone, a further Western incursion into their natural sphere of influence. It would be like Russia going to Mexico and saying to the Mexican president, we stand with you against the US. That's the way they see it. They don't see what possible interest we could have in Ukraine. Obama's not Carter, he's Eisenhower. It's an article in foreign, uh, foreign policy saying on November the 4th, 1956, Soviet tanks rolled into Budapest after Hungarian authorities announced that they would withdraw from the Warsaw Pact. A last desperate teletype message from Hungarian insurgents read, they just brought us a rumor that the American troops will be here within one or two hours. We are well and fighting. Troops were not on the way. U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower, who had vowed to roll back Soviet control of Eastern Europe, did nothing, and the Hungarian uprising was crushed. Leaders of both U.S. parties accused Eisenhower of kowtowing to the Soviets. Stevenson, the Democratic candidate for president, alleged that the incumbent had brought the coalition of the free nations to a point where even its survival has been threatened saying Russia has invaded a border nation once again, and once again the American president stands accused of vacillation. And I, I conclude by saying, you know, I think President Barack Obama has been unfairly characterized as somehow too cerebral and weak-willed. The president has deployed a below-the-radar, driving from behind most of the time. Very 21st century, multi-dimensional approach incorporating cyber war currency wars, I am sure, and a sophisticated new hybrid war whose first iteration was seen in Benghazi, then Syria, and more recently Ukraine. <coughs> the president was seeking to press an advantage right on the border of Russia. That's not soft-centered. The fact that Vladimir Putin has been able to staunch the advance speaks to Putin's formidable adversarial skills. It would be unconscionable for Putin to lose Crimea, the port of Sevastopol, to think he would simply roll over is absurd. I concluded by saying President Obama is waging a subtle game, but may no, make no mistake, it's a very offensive game. Just because no one cares to appreciate its offensive nature and nuances is, I'm sure, quite painful for the President. 
I'll put up a photograph of President Obama as seen on the front of Life magazine. Ukraine hasn't made its February fuel payment and owes Russia $1.89 billion, according to the gas export monopoly Gazprom. So you can see where the counterattack is going to come. Japan wants to prioritize discussions on China and clarify the respective U.S. and Japanese roles in the event of a grey zone incident, said a Japanese government official, referring to less than full-scale systematic military attacks backed by a state but still representing a threat to Japan's security. Where grey zone tensions are rising, joint intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance are vital. The reason that is needed is to prevent the grey zone from becoming black. And this is all about the quality of the U.S.'s guarantee to Japan and the fact that, you know, I've said it before, while Shinzo Abe might well be the wingman, you know, we don't know what kind of leash he's on. And I think the Japanese are continually seeking to show that it's a very long leash. Uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar are primarily responsible for the sectarian and terrorist and security crisis of Iraq, Nuri al-Maliki. South African and Rwanda uh, have expelled diplomats in a row over Rwandan exiles. Um, late on Monday, armed men broke into the Johannesburg home of former Rwandan Army Chief General Faustin Kayumba Nyamwasa, an exiled critic of Rwandan President Paul Kagame. Uh, Nyamwasa survived an assassination attempt in Johannesburg in 2010, but was not in the house at the time. Diplomatic source who asked not to be named told Reuters that South African security services had tracked the attackers. It was very clear there were intelligence personnel attached to the Rwandan embassy, the source added. Three diplomats from the Rwandan mission in Pretoria were ordered out of the country in 48 hours this week. Kigali's tit-for-tat expulsions followed on Friday. And the interesting point to note is South Africa and Rwanda are on opposite sides in the DRC. Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, said on the two issues of principle, history and territory, there is no room for compromise. Um, he also said the Asia-Pacific should be a testing ground for our commitment to build a new model of relations rather than a competitive arena. I'll put up a photograph of him. Um, now going to the MH370, Saturday's red-eye flight vanished at cruising altitude in clear skies en route from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. No distress signal appears to have been sent, no wreckage has been found, and no aircraft malfunction has been identified. Um, the Boeing 777-200ER is presumed to have crashed off the coast of Vietnam. Two passengers aboard were possibly traveling under stolen passports. The aircraft do not crash while en route like this, said Paul Hayes, Director of Safety at Flight Global Ascend. It is an extremely unusual event. I'll put up a photograph of this Boeing. Um, taken as it was taking off from Charles de Gaulle Airport. Use of stolen passports by two passengers to board a Malaysian airliner that vanished over the South China Sea sends a red flag that terrorism may, play, have, may, may have played a part. There needs to be a full scrub of everyone on the flight and all U.S. intelligence agencies are working with their counterparts in Asia. This advert of David holding an AR-50A1 rifle has provoked anger in Italy. And then The Guardian has an interesting article about the man of the people, Pope Francis, uh, and some are called Julian Coman, saying way beyond the ranks of the faithful, the first Latin American pontiff has wowed the world, and I couldn't agree more. I really think it's been a revelation. Coming to currency markets, the euro is at 138.87, dollar index 79.69, Japanese yen 103.04, GDP Q4 GDP in Japan grew at an annualized 0.7% <coughs> from the previous quarter. Expectations were for 0.9 to 1%. Swiss franc 0.8770. Um, the pound 167.34. The Aussie 0.9040. India rupee 61.30. South Korean won 1065.85. So these be higher beta currencies have improved somewhat. Real 234.04. Egyptian pound 696.83 and the Rand 1077.13. This is interesting. China's overseas shipments unexpectedly declined 18.1% in February from a year earlier. That is some number. 
um, expectations were for a 7.5% increase. Imports rose 10.1%. Dollar index, I'll put up a three month chart of that. 79.69, below 80. Um, defined the bulls, uh, more uh, optimistic projections. Trades very soft, not, you know, I don't think it's going to the upside anytime soon at the moment. Euro dollar 138.87, I'll put up a three month chart of that. You know, Draghi called uh, the euro a zone of stability. Um, he sort of poo pooed the idea that the inflation rate is going lower and he's built up more confidence in the euro, and we can see that. And my stock still remains in play at 133.80. Dollar yen, 103.04. I'm still a buyer of the yen on dips, actually, notwithstanding the fact that the economy expanded less than estimated in the fourth quarter. Current account deficit widened to a record in January. Gold, 1334.26, I'll put up a three-month chart. Gold off to its best start in six years and had topped 1350. You can see it on that chart, an ounce. Goldman's remain bearish, as do I. They say chances are increasing that prices will slump to $1,000 for the first time since 2009. There's been a perfect storm of geopolitical uncertainty as well as growth, as well as growth scares here in the U.S., Gold futures were up 1.3% last week. That's the eighth weekly advance. Crude oil, 102.42. Um, bullish bets on crude oil rose 2.2%, uh, most ever in records going back to June 2006. WTI touched 105.22 on March 3, which was the highest since September. I think uh, it's very, very toppy indeed. Karl Lagerfeld is to design a hotel. And he said, an entire hotel designed by me. It's the very first time for me. I think the idea is great. Coffee, I'll put up a three-month chart. You can see that's up 78% since December. And interestingly, interesting to learn, Prosecco has replaced Champagne as the world's favorite sparkling wine. The Italians will be pleased about that. Coming to Africa, um, I like this infographic that came out of the Africa CEO Forum. Africa's economic opportunities, um, and I'm going to be speaking about that over the weekend. South African all shares up 3.84% so far this year, not far off a record. Sim Shababalala, um, who's the co-CEO of Standard Bank, uh, said there are massive profit pools on the African continent, and that's all about their strategy to double down on African growth, to, to uh, deploy more resources on the continent which led to a very strong rest of Africa performance. Dollar Rand, 10.77. We're unable to break through that resistance level. I'll put up a three-month chart of that. The Egyptian pound remains firm, um, 6.96.83. The Egyptian uh, stock market up 17.13% so far this year. That's the best performing stock market in Africa. Nigerian all share down 5.44% so far this year. Um, a lot of drip, drip of bad news coming out of there. Um, the Naira is the most expensive currency on a real effective exchange rate basis, according to Reuters. I'll put up a diagram, you can see that. Unilever plans a manufacturing plant in Ethiopia as growth surges. Unilever, the world's second biggest consumer products maker, plans to open a manufacturing plant in Ethiopia during the next year in a bid to emulate its expansion in Vietnam. London and Rotterdam-based companies renting premises for a plant in the Chinese-built Eastern Industry Zone in Dukem, 19 miles southeast of the capital, Addis Ababa. Dougie Brew, head of corporate affairs in Africa, said in a phone interview on March 4, Unilever already imports Knorr, stock cubes, and Omo detergent into Ethiopia. May initially make fabric cleaning soaps before moving into food, he said from London. The plans are ambitious for Ethiopia because we see it as a growing market. We're taking a long-term investment decision in Ethiopia because of the demography, broad-based growth and opportunity to create a genuinely inclusive and sustainable business model from scratch. Ethiopia's economy is projected to expand 8% in the 12 months to July 7, after growing an average of 9.3% for the past four years. Population last year of 93.9 million people, very much the holy grail for consumer goods companies. Yum Brands, <coughs> the owner of the KFC fast food chain, said on March 6, it's considering entering Ethiopia as it expands across the continent. 
um, in businesses like ours, it always makes sense to manufacture close to the consumer, said Unilever. Africa's digital revolution full speed ahead. This is all about the undersea fiber optic cables, more than 500 million mobile phone subscribers. Um, and uh, McKinsey's predicting that the continent can gain 300 billion by 2025 if it embraces the internet as it did mobile phones. The chamber, by majority, finds Jermaine Katanga guilty of complicity in the crimes committed on February the 24th, 2003, said Judge Bruno Cotti. The verdict was uh, only the ICC's third and its second conviction since opening its doors more than a decade ago. Dakar, Senegal, Gambia's president said he wants to implement a policy change that would shift the country's language from English to a local language. We no longer subscribe to the belief that for you to be a government, you should speak the English language. We should speak, you should speak our language, President Yahya Jame said during the swearing-in ceremony of Gambia's new Chief Justice that aired on state-run Gambia television services on Friday. I'll put up a photograph of him. He's a very curious man. International airlines have cancelled flights to and from Sierra Leone after a UN aviation regulator discovered that the only functioning fire engine at its main airport had broken down. An airport official and airline staff said on, Monday, said on Sunday, I'll put up a photograph of Freetown International Airport. Coming here to Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta said that he and the Deputy President William Ruto will take a 20% pay cut while members of his cabinet will see their pay reduced by 10% with immediate effect. Kenyatta said a new policy will restrict foreign journeys to only the most essential. He said rules will be enforced to reduce wasteful government spending. Kenya is spending close to $4.6 billion in salaries, leaving only $2.3 billion for development. We need to deal with this monster, and if we are to develop this nation otherwise sooner or later, we will become a nation that only collects taxes to pay ourselves, he said. Anti-corruption crusader Malimu Mati said he is treating the president's announcement of a pay cut as a gimmick. On Friday, before I read all, before I found out about the president's pay cut, I was responding to an article in the Wall Street Journal, and I said, you know, the Achilles' heel of the African resurgence is the recurrent expenditure salaries component of their budgets. Essentially, government in Africa is fabulously expensive and its productivity shockingly low. As our economies grow in Africa, seeking to accelerate its convergence, it's happening about that, let there be no doubt. African governments are beginning to load their balance sheets. The train wreck risk, whilst a residual one, might grow because I have yet to see or meet an African politician who is prepared to take a scalpel to the cost of delivering government in Africa. And therefore, I stand corrected. British American investments reported fully a profit after tax accelerated 5.33%. They are clearly seeking to dash for growth in geographical region that can be seen in the plus 28.838% full year revenue gain. It looks fairly priced to me now after a pretty aggressive rally that started in Q4 2013. France Telecom, the group has recently started a strategic review with regards to our activities in Uganda and Kenya. Um, the revelation came two weeks after Telecom Kenya's board met with the request for more shareholder funding top on its agenda. Um, and there's been a lot of talk there up on the chopping block. Hertz complained that the Kenya government appeared oblivious to the troubles in the tourism sector. One would think that the government is very much aware that this Kenya destination needs a lot of support. I think they've just lost contact with the reality on the ground and nobody's taking any measures to correct that. Kenya is making things difficult to sell Kenya as a destination. The Nairobi all shares up 3.23% this year. The NSE 20 is down 0.39% so far this year. Every listed share can be interrogated. We've had plenty of results. If you go and have a look at that link, that's the, the lowest link on Rich Wrap Ups. It says every listed share can be interrogated here. And don't forget, if you want to track the stock market in real time, just register on rich.co.ke, get a password, and go to Rich Live, and you'll be all set. Once again, thank you.